Monday evening, everybody. Hope you guys had a, a great weekend and um, had a, uh, um, opportunities to rest and recharge and refresh and um, refocus. Um, hopefully you spent some time uh, in fellowship with other believers in worship and um, in remembrance and also in hearing the word of God and being equipped uh, to uh, just to walk uh, more uh, uh, prepared. Um, the word calls it in 2 Timothy 3.16, perfected uh, to do the work that God's called us to do. So hopefully you had an opportunity for that this weekend. Um, let's go to the word tonight and let's open with the word of prayer. And then get right into the word of God. The Bible tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word. So let's pray. Mighty God, I just come before you right now. And we thank you. We praise you, God, for uh, another start to a week, God. And we thank you for the day that we've had and for the things that you brought us through, for the various ways that you've provided, the various ways you've sustained, the various ways you've healed, the various ways you've delivered. God, the various ways that you've protected us and covered us, God, maybe even in unseen ways that we haven't even become aware of yet, God, I just thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness towards us, Father. Father God, I just pray that you right now just refresh us, God, through your word, um, that you will allow your word, your perfect word, your living word, your powerful, active word, God, to do a good work in each and every one of us, God, uh, preparing us, correcting us, washing us, uh, encouraging us, God, uh, strengthening us, equipping us, God, to be that who you call us to be. Um, Father, you're coming very, very soon, and, and it won't be long before we see uh, our Lord and Savior face to face, and we'll hear that trumpet sound, and we'll all leave. And uh, I know more and more every day, God, the scriptures where it says, come, uh, Lord Jesus, come. Even more quickly, God, come, come. We are just in that phase right now, God, of saying, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We desire your coming. And, Father, uh, as we wait, I pray that we are ready. I pray that we are prepared, God, for your return. So, God, just do a good thing in us tonight as we hear from your word. And you prepare us, God, as we prepare ourselves uh, for your return. Uh, we love and we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to encourage you tonight. I'll go to the book of Matthew. Um, uh, chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19 tonight. <clears throat> and I know you're probably curious about my uh, title. Um, I think you'll figure it out in a minute. And uh, I've got two passages of scriptures I'm going to read to you tonight. One from Matthew and one from the book of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. And uh, But these are uh, powerful words to be uh, uh, just held on to and to not just be listened to, but also put into action in our lives as we are preparing for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is coming very, very soon. Um, but I want to ask you a question, you know, since we're preparing for a, uh, we're preparing for a trip. Okay. It's not a vacation. It's, it's, we're preparing for the next uh, leg of this journey in our relationship with God. Uh, we're stepping from this temporary place into eternity, and we've been hearing about it for thousands of years. Uh, I know I've been hearing about it for my entire lifetime. Uh, so 51 years I've been on this earth, I've been hearing about the coming of Jesus. Others uh, of you just as long, if not longer, maybe some of you are fairly new to that conversation. But regardless, Jesus is coming, and he wants us to be prepared. He wants us to be ready. And just like any other trip, you know, we get a kick out of uh, uh, watching um, kids and even adults when we announce we're going on a mission trip. And uh, the thing most of them, unless they have done this before, they don't realize there's a restriction <clears throat> on what you can take with you uh, on those travel restrictions. And not so much travel restrictions set by, uh, you know, the airlines or anything like that, but travel restrictions that... Uh, we as a group set in place because we have to transport all of that stuff either in vans or vehicles or trailers or airplanes. And, you know, so we limit people usually to, you know, um, a suitcase and a carry-on and that's all you get. 
for however long we're going to be going, you have to pack it tight and pack it in there and, and make it work. And um, so, uh, you know, it really, and that causes some serious issues for some people who are like, you got to be kidding me. I got to pack 10 days or 14 days, or even some people it's like a weekend, you know, they, they pack, you know, uh, 10 bags, 12 bags just to go away for a few days. They got to take every single one of their belongings because they can't choose which ones of them they most need and which one of those things they don't need. What's important, what's not important. They just pack it all and take it with them because they have the mentality. Well, I never know when I might need it, you know? Um, and uh, you know, there's, uh, there's all kinds of issues there, but tonight I'm just using that as an example uh, for what we're going to hear about in our passage tonight. As we're preparing for Jesus to come, there are travel restrictions. Absolutely, there are travel restrictions to when Jesus returns. And it starts now. The travel restrictions go into place now in our own personal lives. So the book of Matthew, chapter 19, beginning in verse uh, 16. It says, and behold, uh, one came and said unto Jesus, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, uh, eternal life, then keep the commandments. And he said unto Jesus, uh, which ones? And Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and mother. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth uh, up, up until now. What lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that uh, thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. I love that. I'm going to read that passage or that little verse right there in the Message Bible. Just listen, it says, here's Jesus' response to the young man's question about, Hey, I've done all of the commandments. I've kept, I've done all the religious stuff. I've kept every law, part of the law to the letter. I have done it. So what must I else have to do, Jesus? And Jesus says in verse 21, if you want to give it all you've got, go sell your possessions, give everything to the poor. All your wealth will then be in heaven. Then come and follow me. It says, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man uh, shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard this, uh, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? See, I find that interesting, you know, um, because, you know, a lot of us read this text and we don't consider ourselves rich and uh, by this world's standards. But, uh, you know, I want you to consider something for most people, especially those who live in America right now, um, even the poorest of us in America. Um, would be considered uh, successful to some level in certain other third world countries. And so, you know, uh, it's something to really be considered, you know, uh, you know, a rich man, a guy who has something, a guy who has things that he cherishes, that he, you know, um, has accumulated. You know, I watch people um, when it comes time to, you know, downsize or maybe they've had a death in the family and they start going through a loved one's belongings. And, um, you know, you have to make decisions. What are you going to pack? What are you going to sell? What are you going to divvy up between the relatives? And I mean, it's just amazing to watch, you know, how people just, you know, uh, just start holding on to things. I don't even know why they're holding on to them, you know, <clears throat> knickknacks and whatnots and mementos and things they think they have to have to remember that person. 
And, uh, you know, we've got piles of junk uh, all over the place. Um, and uh, one of the big interesting things about our culture today is, is the, the rise of so many uh, self-storage facilities. You know, you can either go and pay for a self-storage facility and you can take your stuff there and fill up a, a room any size you want, fill it up, and, and somebody will watch over it and charge you for that um, and keep your stuff safe for you while you're not ever even looking at it. It's, it's out of sight, out of mind. Um, or you can rent a storage unit on your own property and have it brought to you. Or some people are even, you know, uh, thrifty enough. They're like, well, I'll just buy my own storage unit and pack it full of junk. Other people have garages. They can't even put cars in because they're packed full of junk. We've got attics and crawl spaces and sheds and things like that. And there's so much stuff, you know, you just don't even know what to do. You, know, you just keep storing it away and storing it away and storing it away. And then in, in, at some level, you begin to pay for all the stuff that you're storing away. And it just doesn't make any sense. And so here the conversation is, um, you know, uh, that this young man, he went away sorrowful for he had much. See, we need to transfer in our minds. It's not about rich. It's about the much that you have. And I guarantee you, even uh, you, it, those of us who are bold enough to walk around and say, well, I don't have anything. I really don't care. You know, I guarantee you there's something. There's at least there's a few somethings in your life that are you're hard put to lay aside. You're hard put to, to, to not uh, part with. And, uh, and yet, you know, Jesus speaks volumes to that. He says, hey, he goes, um, uh, you know, it'd be easier, you know, for a camel to be thread through the eye of the needle than a man who has much stuff to make it into heaven. And um, I wonder if heaven was restricted and you could only pack on, you know, you, you, the only thing you could take to heaven is what fits in a carry-on, would it go in your carry-on? You know, because that would really show you what the treasure of your life is. If you're wanting to take it from this life to the next, you'll pack it in your carry-on. Um, but see, with Jesus, there's no carry-ons. There is no carry-ons. There's no, you can't check in a bag. You can't pre-ship a bag. You, there's no carry-ons. Matter of fact, there's, you can't, he doesn't even want you to carry it on in this life. He doesn't. He, he, he speaks over and over again in the Gospels. Jesus was very clear um, about things in Matthew chapter 6. He says, look, he goes, why are you worried about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, and where you're going to lay your head? I mean, those are the three major issues that people are consumed with in this life. What am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? And where am I going to sleep? You know, the, the roof over my head. We spend so much time, effort, and money involved in those three things. We spend so much time and effort earning the money. And then we spend so much time and effort spending the money so that we can consume those three items, the, the food, the clothing, and the, and the shelter over our heads. And we're not even going to count in, you know, the cars the, and entertainment and the other stuff that we think is important. Um, and Jesus says the people who have much, it's going to be hard for them to enter into heaven. And this is a reality. This is the truth. And I want you to think about this, you know, because the, one of the signs of the end of the age is going to be where people are going to be forced to make a choice between how they purchase things, buy and sell, by whether or not they'll take something called the mark of the beast. And everybody's heard about that. I mean, it's... It's, it's, there's not one person on planet earth who's not familiar with the mark of the beast. Um, so, it, you know, that's interesting. Everybody thinks, oh, well, <clears throat> you know, we're not going to be here. We're going to be raptured out of here beforehand. You're wrong. You're not going to be raptured out of here because that's going to be a choice. Um, if, if all the Christians are gone, who cares whether you take a mark or not? You know, if, if all of the believers are gone, who cares about the choice? Who cares about the mark? They're already gone. So what's the mark got to do with anything? This is going to be something that hits uh, the church and hits Christians and sinners alike. It's going to be something in which it's going to be a harvesting tool in which there will be a separation between the sheep and the goats, the wheats and the tares, just as Jesus prophesied in the Gospel of Matthew, that these things are going to transpire. And when you have to make a choice between your physical 
and your spiritual. When you have to, when you're going to be more concerned about your physical comfort, okay, your physical uh, sustenance and, and, and those types of things versus the kingdom of God. And that's, that's going to be tough. But Jesus says that's the choice I want you to make. So that's coming. And then for all who make this ultimate choice, um, not too far down the road here um, with uh, the receiving of the mark, whatever that looks like, you know, um, you can, whether it's a literal, literal mark or a, a spiritual mark, it really doesn't matter because see, by the time you put it on your hand or by the time you put a mark on your head, you've already put a mark in your heart. Before you get to the point place, or you're willing for somebody to mark your hand or mark your head so that you can buy something, um, your heart's already been marked. Regardless of what you put on your external, your internal's already been marked because you've given yourself over to desiring those things so badly that you would go against biblical prophecy that says anyone who receives that mark will not be permitted to into eternal life with Jesus Christ. They will miss out on the kingdom of heaven if you receive that mark. It is like the point of no return uh, is, is how that works. And, and so before you know, you ever get to putting it externally, it's going to be a choice you've already become quite comfortable with internally in your heart. See, and that's why this conversation here in this passage of Scripture in the Gospel of Matthew is so interesting um, and yet so prophetic as well because this man has said, came to Jesus and said, I've done everything there is to do by religious law. I've, I've kept the Ten Commandments and more. I've done well, Jesus. What else? Jesus says, go and sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. Notice the beckoning is not just to sell it all and give it to the poor, but then come and follow me. Okay? Uh, the I am the one who, he says there later in the scriptures, you know, uh, the apostle Paul would remind the church that uh, he's the one who provides seed for the sower. Huh? He provides bread for those who are hungry. He, he's, he's the one who is the multiplier of the seed that is sown so that you receive such a bountiful harvest. He, he is the provider, sustainer. He will meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That this is the God you're going to serve, so he's going to take care of you. And yet um, we have a struggle here. And, and, and what it is is it's the struggle uh, between the spirit of God and the spirit of this world, between the spirit of God and the Antichrist is what it is. And it's been going on for years, and, and we're struggling with it even now today. Let's go on here. It says um, that he went away sorrowful, and then Jesus said, it's going to be easier for you to thread a camel through the eye of a needle than for people who are attached to their stuff to go to heaven. And that's so true. When you look at what's going on in our culture today, churches, by and large, are not back to anywhere near uh, capacity, okay? Uh, with what we're facing in our world today, churches ought to be bursting at the seams with people crying out to God for deliverance and crying out to God for healing, crying out to God for provision, crying out to God in repentance. But yet there's no, there's no, uh, there, there's, it's not standing room only at the church. We're still at the place where people are afraid even to return to church. They're not afraid to go to Walmart to get their food because see that they have to have that. They're worried about three things, where I'm going to put my head, where I'm going to fill my belly and what I'm going to wear. So they're, they, they're going to have no problem getting to Walmart. They have no problem getting to work. They have no problem, uh, you know, whatever they have to do to, to pay the bills and put the roof over their head and all that kind of stuff. But they won't fill a church. You know, we won't, we won't fill a church. We'll do all the other things, but we won't fill the church. And that's a revelation. That's, a, that's an evidencing of what's really going on in the hearts of men. We're much like this young man who came to Jesus and said, I do all the religious stuff but I can't part with my physical worldly stuff. Not to follow you, Jesus. This disturbed the disciples, it says. Um, verse 25 here in Matthew 19, it says, when the disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? And Jesus uh, beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible. 
But with God, all things are possible. Now that's something to hold on to right there because, yeah, I, I know what I'm saying seems hard. It seems absurd. It seems crazy. It seems, you know, uh, completely unrealistic, especially by today's standards in our world, you know, because we're so accustomed to, shut, you know, running down to Starbucks or over to Dairy Queen or out to McDonald's or maybe just down to the store. You know, you got to run to the Walmart, you got to run to the Publix, you got to run to the Kroger's, you got to run to wherever you got to run down and get your, 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 your stuff. And then you go home and you, you know, you cook all your meals at home or whatever, you know, so you feel better about yourself, but still it all depends on that stuff. And, and, you know, those things all take precedence, uh, you know, in this society, in this world. And so it kind of makes it um, hard to separate and, and understand what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I understand how hard it is. I understand how, how hard it is to break the mold of going through this, this, this rat race of a life that, that we've been programmed to run so much program that we even kind of enjoy the rat race and we've kind of, you know, we, we've learned how to navigate the rat race. And, and that's the truth. I was thinking today, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at how many people, you know, the, the comfort level that people now are stepping into with what they call the new normals, you know, of uh, wearing masks and social distancing and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's becoming like now just the norm. People are just stepping into it and getting used to it. And Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting used to it. We're good, you know, and we're just kind of adjusting. And, and that, but see, that's what we do. See, the world makes us, the world says, here's the rules. And then for a minute, we kind of, balk at them a little bit and kind of kick back and say, no, I don't think so. But, you know, when the world doesn't give and see the world holds all the cards because the world holds all the cards to the things that we want. We, 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 they, it knows what we need. It knows the three things we're concerned about, food, clothing, and shelter. So the world holds all the keys there. And, 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 and so we give at some point and we, we learn how to work within the system in a way that we feel good about ourselves, that we haven't compromised our faith. <laughs> Jesus says, look, you know, this is an all or nothing kind of thing. You got to either go all in with me or don't go in at all. God's not a part God. In Matthew chapter six, down in verse 33, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he tells us there, he goes in all these other things that, that, seemingly are important to you and everybody else around you. He says the things that the pagans chase after, he goes, I'll add all these things unto you. I'll take care of it. Even though it seems impossible because you're not going to, it's like, well, well the, the only way I'm going to ever get that stuff is if I go and get into the rat race. And Jesus says, would you, would you just chill out and let me show you how this works? Why don't you start to trust me and let me, let me show you how I can provide for you. Let me show you how I can sustain you. Let me show you how I can shelter you. And, um, you know, I, I love the Old Testament when Jesus or when God uh, delivered uh, Israel out of Egypt. You know, he promised to be their God. He promised to sustain them, feed them, clothe them. He promised the shoes on their feet would not wear out while they followed him. And yet, just the, the nation of Israel struggled. They struggled with, with, first of all, seeing it. Then second of all, being content with it, they grumbled, they complained, they murmured because they got tired of what God provided. You know, all God provides is this old bread every day. You know, we want we want to go back to Egypt where at least if we were slaves, we got three square meals of different stuff a day. We got we could have veggies and we could have this and we could have that. And uh, we just want some good old fashioned meat. You know, they were just grumbling and murmuring against God. And, and that was their continued behavior because, see, they had their eyes on the world, not having their eyes on God. No matter how faithful God was, their focus on him was temporary. And soon as, sure enough, sooner or later, their eyes got back over on the world, and they wanted that the, the world, for some reason, just looked good to them. The problem with that is it's, it's a lie. It looks good, but it'll cost you everything. Think about this. This young man went away sorrowful because he could not do that thing which Jesus requested and then come and follow me. And the beckoning is there. It was come and follow me. I'm the one who can take five loaves and two fish and feed 5,000. 
Come and follow me. I'm the one who can speak to the wind of the waves and tell them to be still. Come and follow me. I'm the one who can heal every sickness, every disease, every ailment. Come and follow me. I'm the one who can raise the dead back to life. Come and follow me. I can walk on water. Come and follow me. And yet they failed to just go, oh, that's that Jesus. That's that Jesus. Come and follow me. Interesting to, to think about that in this story as well, that this was not a request Jesus was asking without evidence that he was able to sustain them. And we have evidence in our own lives that Jesus is able to sustain us. God is able to sustain us. If we but trust him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, everything that we have, every fiber of our being needs to be in a trust relationship with God. Because none of that other stuff at the end of the day is going to matter. It's not going with us. It's not going with us. Even to the standpoint that if your friends aren't saved, they aren't going with you. If your children aren't saved, they aren't going with you. If your spouse isn't saved, they aren't going with you. If your parents aren't saved, they aren't going with you. It, it, that's, that's, that's harsh reality, folks, but that's the truth. That's the truth. And, you know, I wonder if, you know, some of our carry-on baggage that we want to carry on with us when Jesus comes is we think we're going to be able to carry on our kids with us. They have to make their own choice for Jesus. We're going to carry on our spouse with us. No, nope, they have to make their own choice for Jesus. They're hearing the same gospel that you've heard, and, and they better have heard it from you. If you're married, you better be preaching to your spouse. If you have children, you better be preaching to your children. You better be raising them up. And I'm telling you from babies, you ought to be teaching them that Jesus is coming, that the way unto, unto, unto God is, is through Christ Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life, that all should repent, all need to be baptized, all should be filled with the Holy Ghost and living righteously because Jesus is coming soon. You ought to be training your kids from babies uh, to understand that. I was taught from a baby to understand that. It's, it's not an impossibility. It's a reality that we should be living in, uh, preparing for the journey because no one's going to get to take anybody else with them. The only person you get to be accountable for is you. And here's, here's the disturbing part of this, too. You know, when that last trumpet sounds, it's, the Bible tells us that all creation is going to hear his entrance. See, we've been sold this bill of goods that it's going to happen quietly and nobody will know you're gone. They'll just kind of go looking for you and they'll find a pile of clothes laying over in the corner. And, oh, well, where did mama go? No, they're going to visibly see it. They're going to li they're literally, literally going to hear that trumpet. That trumpet's going to shake the entire earth as Jesus Christ, the living word, creator God in the flesh, enters into this world to receive his church, his bride unto himself. And we which are in Christ are going to receive him with open arms and, and shouts of acclamation and praise. And we're just going to be, we're going to be caught up in the air with him. But then everybody else who's either, that has not been able to sever their ties with this world, they're going to be left and they're going to watch us ascend into heaven with Christ and they're going to be left here. And there's going to, the Bible tells us there's going to be great weeping. There's going to be great sorrow. There's going to be great gnashing of teeth. They're going to, they're going to know the glory of God. They're going to understand the glory of God. The truth of the gospel will be fully revealed to them, but there'll be nothing that they can do about it because they missed. They were not ready for the journey. That's tough stuff, man. But the Bible says, with God, all things are possible. With God, all things, he's, he's not asking you to live an impossible life here. All things are possible with God. Let's continue here. Verse 27 says, and Peter said unto him, behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto you, that you have which, uh, that you which have followed me, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, they shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. 
But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So, you know, here's here's something to think about, guys. Um, you know, when he says that, uh, that forsaking, that's a toughie, you know, because there are people who literally – um, the great sorrow for them is, is that they really don't want to leave this earth if so and so is not going. That tells you where. If, if right now, if I told you Jesus is coming, and you know you have unsaved loved ones, would you choose to stay here with them or to go with Jesus? Maybe it's your spouse. They don't. They're not serving Jesus right now. Would you choose to stay with them or to serve Jesus? To go with Jesus when he returns? See, for some of you, that question is not a hard question to answer because some of you have unsaved uh, family members. It's a spouse or it's the kids or something like that. And, uh, you know, uh, you, you constantly compromise your church attendance to satisfy the spouse or the kids, or maybe it's an unsaved mom or dad or other family members, extended family members, and they always plan uh, family events on church days, uh, family outings or uh, whatever. And uh, and so you compromise, you know. See, that tells you where your affections are. That that gives you a good insight as to what is truly, uh, you know, uh, where, where your affections truly lie because, um, you're, you're willing to compromise and set aside where God said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the habit of some is, as you see the day of the Lord approaching, but that we should gather together for the purpose of spurring one another on in love, uh, that we should gather together um, as the congregation of the saints for times of remembrance and fellowship and, and uh, you know, prayer and, and, and uh singing psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms and songs and making melody in our hearts to the Lord, those kinds of things. We forsake that and sit all that aside because, you know, um, our, our husband or our wife or our boyfriend or our girlfriend or our kids or our mom or our dad or our brothers or our sisters or whatever, whatever, you know, they put pressure on us. You know, oh, well, come on. We don't ever get to see you very often. Or this is my one day off. Can't you just stay home with me and let's let's just hang out? Or, hey, let's take the kids to the beach today and let's just hang out. Or, you know, well, this is so-and-so's, you know, uh, anniversary party and Sunday was the only day we could plan it. You know, can't you stay? Can't you come? You know, and so those affections just pull our heart and we quickly just say, okay, yeah, I can do church next week. I guess I can miss once. What if Jesus came back on that day? What if Jesus came back on the day when you said, yeah, I can miss out today. That this party is more important or, you know. Hmm. Many that are first shall be last. In the last chapter I mean, first. I think of that verse a lot, you know, and it's, uh, you know, we, we use that out of context quite a bit because it doesn't fit the context of this conversation. Um, but what it's talking about is, is a lot of the people that think they're going, they're not. And a lot of people that are, have been told or made to feel as if they're not good enough to go, um, they're going. <laughs> it's just, just the way it is. Or those that have been, ridiculed and mocked or made fun of and uh, laughed at for their radical uh, life that they follow Jesus with, um, they'll be the ones to go. And the ones that have been doing the, uh, I don't know, the, the just the, uh, uh, and maybe it's just sometimes it's not just poking fun at it. It's just, you know, they just kind of, have been throwing that thing in front of you in in certain ways and they're going to be left behind and it's going to, so the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And it's like I say, it's not talking about, uh, you know, um, your position with God other than, um, those who think they're going on just like our young man here in the scriptures. He thought he had done everything right, but he missed out on what Jesus had for him. I don't want you to miss out on what Jesus is. He's coming soon. I don't want you to miss out on that. There's nothing on this earth that's, that's important. Nothing. Nothing at all. I want to take you to another passage of Scripture. And um, my last passage for the night is found in the verse of, uh, book of 1 Timothy, chapter 6. 
1 Timothy chapter 6. There's a couple of passages in here I want to bring out for you. Um, Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, it says, But the godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, clothing, let us be therewith content. Let me read that in the Message Bible to you. A devout life, uh, does bring wealth, but it's the rich simplicity of being yourself before God. Since we entered the world penniless, and we will leave it penniless. If we have bread on the table and shoes on our feet, that's enough. See, sometimes it's not a just... When Jesus sent out his disciples in the Gospels, he sent out the 70, and he told them, he goes, I want you to take the clothes on your back, and the shoes on your feet, and the staff in your hand, and I want you to go, and I want you to go town to town, door to door, house to house, and proclaim the good news of Christ. That's, that's what he told them. Go. Share this message. Um, that's a pretty light load. That's a pretty light load. And that's just about all you're going to, maybe you want to leave this world with that kind of stuff either. You know, I don't, I don't know whether, you know, the Bible doesn't really tell us, you know, if, uh, you know, our <laughs> the clothing on our back is going to stay here or go with us, but really doesn't matter. It says we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. The dead in Christ will rise, and they which will remain will be caught up in the air to meet with him when that last trumpet sounds. Um, so it says, since we entered into this world penniless, we will leave it the same way. And that's the truth. We, leave, we didn't come in with anything. We're not taking anything out with us, okay? Even if you die, you're not taking anything with you. Um, and so many people put so much into, you know, um, the person when they die, but they, they're not taking any of that with them. It's it's all staying here. It's just six feet under, and it's just, you know, covered in dirt. So um, we need to we really need to think about what it is that we have in front of us right now that's obstructing us from doing that which God called us to do, and being ready for His soon return. We need to spend this these next few hours, and I use hours in a very loose interpretation of the term hours, you know, it could be days, weeks, months, it could be a few years, but Jesus is returning. Every day that he gives you life and breath, you need to learn how to do it with less. Do it with less focus on this world, do it with less uh, baggage, and do it with less, you know, you need to spend your time lightening the load, quickly. Lightening the load. Because Man, we're, we're, we're out of here very, very soon. And nothing is going with you. And if you're concerned about loved ones and, and friends and neighbors and co-workers and church members and people like that, you ought to lighten your load here and now of all your earthly, worldly stuff that consumes so much of your time. We wake up in the morning, we're worried about, you know, uh, going to work so we can raise money so we can buy clothes, buy shoes, buy food, pay for a fancy house, pay for cars, pay for toys, pay for this, pay for that, pay for a vacation, pay for travel, pay for retirement, pay for this, pay for that, pay for that. And, and so that's all consumed in stuff that's not going with us. And, uh, and, and then at the end of the day, we spend our whole day consumed with uh, taking care of all that stuff that we haven't taken on any time at all with any effort I mean, of, of sharing the Did you speak of the gospel in, in, a, in a bold, uh, intentional way to any of your friends, neighbors, family members, loved ones, spouse, children? Did you spend any ounce of energy, intentional energy, in saying, look, Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready 
to meet Jesus. I mean, and, and then after you've shared the gospel, maybe you need to spend some time praying over those people because a lot of them aren't going to receive you the first time you speak it to them. You're going to have to spend some time in prayer. And, 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 and pouring it out before the Father, um, doing some spiritual warfare, breaking down those walls and those barriers and, and crying out to God to open those deaf and ears so that they can receive the gospel of Jesus Christ and become new creations before it's too late, before it's too late. Hmm. says here in verse 9, it says, but they that will be rich. Again, that term rich is, a, is, is, is not just a term in which you're a millionaire. Okay? You're considered rich if you have abundance, and, and you do. If you've, got a, if you've got two pennies in the bank, and you've got a full cupboard, and you've got a, a, a car, and you've got more clothes in the closet than you know how to wear. If you've got more than two pairs of shoes, you're in abundance. If you got more than one pair of shoes, you're in abundance. You got more than one pair of clothes, you're in abundance. You got more than one meal's worth of food in the cabinet, you're in abundance. If you're if you're if your bills are paid today and you got money in the bank or money on the way, you're in abundance. You're in abundance. It can even get a little more real than that. If your belly's full at the end of the day. And you've got some place to lay your head, and you're safe, healthy, and and know that Jesus is coming, and you're ready. You're in abundance. You're in abundance. Isn't that something to think about? But they that will be rich, especially if it's in the in the other stuff of this world, you're going to fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful things. Desires which drown men in destruction and perdition. See, that's exactly what's transpiring in the world today is, is that our ability to go and fulfill the Great Commission, to go into all the world and preach the gospel, is being drowned out by our desire to go into all the world and satisfy my needs. I'm going to go into all the world and I'm going to work hard today and earn money so that I can do this, 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 and that. And uh, it's drowning out, leads us into temptation, uh, leads us into uh, the ability, it says here, leads you into snares and pitfalls in which you could literally lose your soul. You could lose your eternity because you're out there pursuing things that God said don't pursue. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he said, all the other stuff, I will add it unto you. Notice he said he would add it unto you. Your job is to seek the kingdom, seek his righteousness. He'll see to it that everything else is taken care of. He'll provide for you. He'll heal you. He'll sustain you. And for some reason, that sounds just completely ridiculous, unrealistic, uh, un, uh, just irrational for most people to hear that and say, oh, yeah, I'm just going to trust God. It sounds like the most irresponsible. Even when I say it, I can say it in, 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 my, in my natural mind. It sounds just foolish. It sounds irresponsible. It sounds because it's, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to be the one that's going to be able to control any of that. I'm going to have to simply say, okay, God, I trust you with this. My job, kingdom pursuit. My job, pursuit of righteousness. My job, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. My job is to share it with my wife, my kids, my, my family members, the, the people in the church, the people in the community. I need to be proclaiming, 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 proclaiming the gospel. I love this. It says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some um, coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Notice this whole money issue, this whole choice of how am I going to buy it? How am I going to satisfy my need? It, it, it's something that has... 
uh, cause many to err from the faith. And it's the truth. It, I mean, I got to just look around culture today, and and that that it, it's the thing that causes people to err from the faith. They either err from the faith in pursuit of money, or they err from the faith in 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 having money. They err from the faith in spending that money. They err from the they err from the faith and having too much of that money because then it provides them a, a very fluent lifestyle and, and, and you never see them in church because they, they, you know, they're traveling. You know, oh, where are you? Oh, we're in the mountains or we're at the beach or, you know, we're on the road or we're, or, you know, we're, we're on the boat this weekend and we're on the jet skis next weekend and we're at the lake house and the mountain house and then we're, oh yeah, we're going to travel to the Disney and then we're over here and we're over there and we're up there and over here and out there. And but where, where they're not is they're not anywhere where the kingdom work is being done. They're never once putting an ounce of effort into the sharing of the gospel. They're not putting an ounce of effort into, um, uh, you know, uh, kingdom service, you know, in which, uh, you know, maybe you're just doing some of the practical kingdom service ministry, like uh, uh, feeding the homeless, uh, sheltering the homeless, uh, giving clothes to those who are, are in need of clothes, uh, uh, visiting the sick and the uh, the imprisoned and other things, you know, just this basic cares ministry, you know, we kind of have to, que- we have to squeeze it into our busy schedules if we're going to do it. You know, it's almost, almost like a, uh, you know, a scheduled in task. Not, it's not a life thing. It's just a scheduled in task in which we can go then and say, look, yeah, I did my thing. I, I do it every Tuesday at four. God didn't call you to do it every Tuesday at four. He called you to live your life doing it. Yeah. The gospel doesn't take days off. The devil don't take days off. Every day you take off, the devil works overtime uh, uh, taking people out and, and, and uh, uh, dragging as many to hell as he can. Um, let's continue here. He says, Thou, O man of God, flee these things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. See, that man, the young man over in Matthew 19, he could not lay hold on eternal life. He couldn't grab hold of it because there was too much stuff in the way. He couldn't get rid of He couldn't take his hands off his, his stuff. He couldn't take his hands off his life to grab hold of eternal life, to grab a hold on to following Jesus. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. And there's many a man and many a woman right now that can't do the same thing. You know God's been tugging at your heartstrings for a long time to change your career, to change your job, to sell your house, to sell your car, to sell your junk, to downsize your house, to get rid of your storage unit, to, to commit yourself to the kingdom of God and his righteousness, to, to, to level that life down and get it down to a place where, you know what, you survive on little and, 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 and God will take care of the rest of it. He's going to sustain you, but, but you don't like how that sounds. You don't even like how that looks. You don't, you don't like anything about it. And it's because you can't let go and you can't lay hold on eternal life. And then you surround yourself with doctors and teachers and theologians and people who tell you, you know, what? oh, well, you know, he didn't really mean you had to do all of that. You know, you, you can be that and, and you can do that. And God's pleased with you. You just need to be the best, whatever it is you're doing. And then, you know, just up your tithe and, up your giving and up your offerings. You know, if you got that much abundance, then give, give, just give more. Give more to the church. They're a bunch of liars. Because, see, the devil uses those liars to make you feel comfortable with what you're, the way you're living rather than you really making the sacrifice and start living the way God wants you to live. Fight the good fight. Lay hold on eternal life. And you got to, he says, seize it. Seize it. Reach out there with both hands. Drop everything else. Reach out there with both hands and seize eternal life. He says, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Because I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot. I love it. Keep this, he says, without spot. In other words, don't fail at it. Unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, nobody can question. You will not be, you will not be, um, uh, 
no one will be able to correct you or to say, ha, see, you were wrong. You're going to hold on to it, and it's going to be without question unrebukable until the day of our of the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his time, in other words, he's going to show up and it's going to be right on time. He will show who is the blessed and only potent, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach, unto whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. I love this. It's powerful. He's coming. He's going to be right on time. Right on time. Time and that time is coming very, very soon, folks. Very, very soon. Um, uh, you know, part of our problem, I think, as the church is, is that we are way too uh, spoiled in our culture. You know, we don't have to sacrifice much um, to become a Christian. It's way too easy. First century church in the Book of Acts, chapter two. Begin reading down at about verse 42 and down through uh, verse 47 or so, uh, you will see a completely different dynamic when it comes to church. There were believers who met daily, um, and they also sold their possessions and their goods. And then they would come together, and they would lay those things at the feet of the apostles, and they would see to it that no one within the fellowship was in need. That's a profound, amazing way to sacrificially live. And we see it in Acts 2, we see it in Acts 5 with Ananias and Sapphira, we see it in Acts 4 uh, with the church, and they came and sold their goods and possessions and brought them to the apostles. It was a repetitive process, a repetitive thing that they would live sacrificially. They didn't they didn't uh, store up or hoard up or you know become collectors of junk. They didn't even put down roots. Um, you know, uh, Peter would write a letter to the churches and he would call them the scattered church. They were literally um, uh, forced to live a nomadic lifestyle simply because of persecution and the cost that it was for them to follow Jesus. Um, everything about them, they lost everything. They would lose their position with Roman uh, culture and society. They would lose their position with uh, Jewish culture and society. They would no longer have the ability to, to uh, earn a wage or uh, have a business or anything like that uh, because if they lived openly for Jesus, it could literally cost them everything. It could cost them their, their everything they have in, in, in their life as well. Um, and that was the first century church and second century church. Um, it wasn't until third or fourth century that um, Christianity um, became um, uh, politically uh, recognized and also politically accepted and then also politically influenced and dramatically changed. And then we you know, kind of are in that culture right now uh, because of those compromises that were made. And, and, and then uh, a lot of our lifestyle as believers has become skewed in the wrong direction because we've moved from living this sacrificial uh, new creation lifestyle in which there was a dependency uh, uh, in, within the body of Christ uh, because you had nothing else to go back to. You, you had to depend on other believers because you couldn't go back to anything else. You, you, there was no hope. If you if you accepted Christ Jesus and were baptized into Jesus and became a Christ follower full of the Holy Ghost, you could not go back. You couldn't go back. It might cost you your life if you go back to your old social circles. It, it was your life was changed, transformed. It was a huge decision, but it was a decision that countless thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people have been comfortable with down through the age. So. Travel restrictions. Yes, Jesus is coming. <clears throat> For those of us who are ready, <laughs> we're leaving <laughs> soon. No carry-ons permitted. Can't check your baggage. Can't ship it ahead. It's time to ditch it. Get rid of it now. Trim down, slim down. Um, get your life down to the bare essentials. Learn how to trust the Lord. Learn how to trust God. And get focused on what's important. Jesus says that we're supposed to be laborers in the vineyard, laborers in the field, 
having one eye on the job, the task at hand that he left us to do. And that was to go on all the world and preach the gospel. And he says, with the other eye, you're supposed to be watching with your eye on the horizon because the master's coming soon and you don't want to be caught uh, laying around. You don't want to be caught not doing your job. You don't want to be caught unprepared because he is coming. And for those that are prepared, it'll be a time of celebration. For those who aren't prepared, it'll be a time of of, of weeping and sorrow and discomfort and, and, and shame and sadness. And you don't want that. So um, this is the time. This is the time. We're getting ready. We're getting ready. Are you ready? Father God, I thank you right now for your word. I thank you for the truth. I thank you for the power of your word, God. I thank you, God, that it's not powerful because I speak it because I'm nothing in and of myself. The power of the word comes that it's a living word. It is, it is the living word, active and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's what the word declares. It is the God-breathed word. It is the spirit-filled word. It is the spirit-revealed word. It is the spirit-empowered word. It is the spirit-anointed word. And therefore, it is the life-changing word. God, so I thank you for it. And tonight, God, I pray that it's changed lives. I pray that it's changed. I pray that it will continue to change lives for as long as people can uh, stumble across these uh, uh, news feeds, videos, broadcasts, whatever we want to call them. Um, God, I pray that it changes somebody's life. Father, right now, I pray for every sinner listening, God, every person who knows they don't have a right relationship with Jesus Christ, that if he comes right now, if that trumpet sounds, it's going to be the least exciting moment in their life. And right now, they do not want that to happen. They, they do not. They're not ready to go. They're not ready to go. And the biggest part of their baggage they need to get rid of, Father, is their sin. And you told us that Jesus came and he became sin for us. So that we who, who had sin could now have no sin. That Jesus would take all of our sin upon himself. And we would become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Father God, right now, I pray for every person who needs to become that new creation of Christ Jesus, who needs to ditch all that sin and give it over to God, cast it all on, on, onto Jesus. He's already taken it. We just need to let him have it. He's already paid for it. Give it to him. Let him take it. Let him deal with it. Let him get rid of it. All your brokenness, your sorrow, your sadness, your failures, your faults, uh, your your shame, uh, all that, all that guilt, just give it all to Jesus. Let him have it. Repent of that thing. Choose never to go back and be that again. Today, choose to become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And the Bible says we can obediently do that when we receive the good news of the gospel. He says that we should repent and then we should be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of our sin. And that we will be filled with the Holy Ghost. The very presence of the living God is going to come and take residence in us. The living word is going to come to live in us. The Holy Ghost is coming to live in us. And, and that's for you tonight. But you have to choose to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. In water. I'm going to tell you, this is your moment and you need to choose. You don't know how many more of these days, how many more messages, how many more opportunities you're going to receive. This might be your last opportunity. That trumpet might sound as soon as I say amen tonight, and the trumpet sounds, and you'll never get another chance. You might you might lose your life tonight. This might be the night that you die in an unexpected way. You might be sitting there thinking to yourself, well, I'm young. I'm healthy. I'm strong. I'm, I'm safe in my bed. And then something horrible happened tonight, and you're dead. And you don't get a chance to change your, your, your position for eternity. You need to choose while you still have life and breath to choose what God has desired. The Bible tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would never perish but have eternal life. That Jesus didn't come into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And that's what his desire is for you. And so right now you need to receive his heart's desire by repenting and being baptized in the name of Jesus. And he's going to take all that sin. The Bible says for the remission of sin, that means he takes it off of you. He takes it out of you. He removes it completely. Then he says, I'm going to fill that with the Holy Ghost. I'll fill every part of you with my presence and my being and my living word. You will be a brand new changed person from this point forward. And uh, 
He's got a great life for you to live. Great life for you to live. You're not going to go back and be your old self. No, you're going to be a, a minister of the gospel. And that doesn't mean you're going to go to Bible college or seminary or all that. He literally means you're going to set this world on fire for Jesus, on fire for the gospel, because you are going to take the same gospel that you received tonight. And tomorrow morning when you wake up, you're going to go out and you're going to start putting your feet to the ground and you're going to walk away from your old life and you're going to go out and start sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and with every person you meet on the street, you're going to start in your neighborhood. You're going to start with your the houses next door. You're going to work your way down the street, downtown, uh, around the corner. You're going to end up on a plane, a train, a car, or a bike someplace. And you're just going to be going and you're going to be sharing the gospel. And that's what God has intended for you. And I'm going to tell you what, he's going to meet and supply every single need that you have along the way. Every single one. Every single one. He can do it. He's a He's, the Bible he said there in Matthew 19, he says, with man it's impossible, but with God it's possible. I love it. God takes the impossible and makes it possible if you're willing to trust him. Tonight, you night, will you be baptized into Jesus? Will you repent? Will you become that new creation? Only you get to choose. Only you get to choose. Christians, uh, I want to talk to you tonight. Uh, what kind of baggage are you carrying are you laying hold? Have you seized eternal life? You know, you might have a list of things you've done. Yeah, I go to church. I give tithes. I I, 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 I sing in the praise team. I, I teach Sunday school. I teach kids church. I volunteer in the parking lot ministry. I do this. I do that. I do this. I do that. I do this. You've got all these things. And Jesus is saying, that's great. Now go sell all your junk and come and follow me. For some of you say, look, he's saying, go sell your home, sell your car, sell everything. Even if it don't make sense, sell it. Sell it. Christian, I'm not telling you something I haven't lived. A year and a half ago, my wife and I had just got finished redecorating the, the house that we had not too long before that had purchased. And I'm sitting on that on the couch and, and I look at her and I said, Baby, I said, God, God wants us to sell it. And she goes, What? Yeah, we gotta sell it. We're supposed to sell it and we're gonna downsize and you know, we're supposed to, you know, uh, buy an RV and we're going to move, move on to the church property and we're going to be ready for uh, whatever phase of life God has next for us. I don't know what it looks like. <laughs> All I know is we got to sell it. And, you know, our first response was, is, man, we just got done. We got just got done uh, painting, redecorating furniture, this, that, and the other thing. The place looked great, you know? And uh, I said, I know, I know. And, and really, you want me to sell this big four bedroom, two bath house, and we're going to go live in an RV? Are you kidding me? And uh, so, uh, you know, we, we I, she said, I got to have, I got to have some time. I said a couple weeks. And so she, uh, she prayed about it, and she came back to me. And she says, yes, yeah. she says, yes, you do. I understand it, but you know, if God spoke it, we're going to do it. See, and that's the first step. When you go, God spoke it, I'm going to do it. Boy, that's that's it. God spoke it. I'm going to do it. See, that's where the man in Matthew 19 missed it. God spoke it, but he didn't do it. Couldn't do it. Um, and, and since then, I'm going to tell you what, it's been an amazing journey, you know, to, to uh, uh, you know, we thought life would be simpler moving in here at the church and maybe a little less busy. It has been one crazy ride for the past almost year and a half now of just, oh, my goodness, you know, I don't know how we would have handled the ministry that God has just literally uh, allowed us to be a part of if we were still living and having to manage and take care of that four bedroom, two bath house. I just don't know how we would have lived that. And it, basically now I see it as a double life. So Christians, I'm speaking to you. What double life are you leaving? What are you leaving right now? Um, and and uh, how willing are you to just say, yes, I'm going to sell it and sacrifice it right now. Right now. Even if God says you're going to live in a car. All right. Well, in the meantime, in the, in the meantime I'll live in a car. It's, it's a roof over your head. <laughs> live in a car. You put your clothes in the trunk. Good to go. You come here and shower at the church if you want to or and, and, and things like that. So God's got a way. He's got things laid out for you. You just got to say, okay, God, I'm following you. You know, and, uh, you know, I, it, it's, it's just it's it's never a dull moment when you turn it over to God that way and let go of everything that seems to uh, be your safety nets 
man, I'm going to tell you, I've got kids. Okay. I've got, I've got a daughter and two boys and you know, this is, this is just, yeah, so don't, don't tell me, Oh, well, I've got kids. I can't do that. That sounds good pastor, but I got kids. Yeah, I got kids. I got a wife, three kids, a dog and a cat. So we, we made it work. Everything, every God made it work. We didn't make it work. We just did what God said and kind of took it one day at a time. And, and, and God's been so faithful. And He just, and still, we don't understand the whole journey. I mean, it's just like I still don't know what He's doing, you know, because it still hasn't unfolded quite the way I thought it was going to unfold. But it's still unfolding. And it's, it's, you know, I'm just telling you, Christian. I'm telling you, Christian. You, it, it, it's nothing is impossible when when you when you just say yes, God, I'll do it. I'm with you. You want me to? You want me to follow you? I'm going to follow you. Jesus spoke to Peter. He said, "Peter, he goes, come and follow me." Peter was busy running his fishing business. He was busy running his fishing business. He says, "Jesus, I'm a fisher of men." He goes, "I got our fisher. He's a fisherman. That's what I do. I fish." He goes, Jesus says, I know. He goes, come follow me. I'm going to teach you to fish for something else. You're not going to fish for fish. You're going to fish for people. And I'll teach you how to come follow me. It says the straightway, Peter got up out of the boat. He left his boat, his nets, his fishing crew, his fishing business. He got up and he followed Jesus. Mm-hmm. Just like that. So, travel restrictions. Yeah. Definitely might be a cause for alarm for some people because now you're going to have to make some serious choices in your life. Serious choices. Eternal choices. Things that are where heaven and hell swing in the balance right here, folks. Choose well, Christian. Father God, right now I just pray for every dear brother and sister in Christ that that has... You know, they, 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 and for themselves, individually, have to lay hold and seize eternal life. With both hands, they got to let go of the world and grab on to you. Grab on to everything that you say, everything that you command, everything that you desire. They got to pursue you. They got to fight that good fight. That, 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 that good fight of faith. That means they, they might not be able to see the end of the road, but all they know is, is that, you put them there and they're going to walk that road and, and you're going to be the provider, the same, the sustainer, the protector, the defender, the deliverer. You're going to be, you're going to be there all in all. And they're good with that. Content with it. God, just, just, man, allow the Holy Spirit just to move in a powerful way upon every single follower of Jesus that's listening right now. And I still pray for every one of those ones that still need to make that choice to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus tonight, God. Letting go of their sin. That's a definite travel restriction. If they have sin, that's cause for alarm because they're not going to get into heaven. May people choose well tonight, God. You've put before them life and death. May they choose life. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, y'all have a wonderful night. Um, God bless y'all. If you need to be baptized and you're anywhere close to Chansey Road Church here in Zephyr Hills, we be located at 34921 Chansey Road in Zephyr Hills, Florida, 33541. Um, if you're in the state of Florida, you can be here. If you're in the furthest southernmost part, you're going to be here in about five, six hours. If you're in the furthest northeast, northwest section in the panhandle there, you can be here in six hours. Trust me, I know I've driven that. So just depends on how bad you want to get here and be baptized. Um, and if you got somebody close to you that's willing to baptize you in the name of Jesus, go to them right now, this hour, because you don't know if the next hour is going to be yours. I already told you, you might perish, you might die, you might, Jesus might come, the trumpet might sound, it'll be too late. Be too late. This is your moment. This is your time. This is your moment. Get going. God will, God will be with you. God will, God will make the way and prepare it for you. He hasn't called you if he hasn't prepared it for you. So uh, step into being baptized into Jesus. Um, if you're coming here to the Church of Chancy Road, message me on, on 
Messenger or on Facebook in the comment portion or on YouTube. Uh, message me there. Um, just comment there and say, hey, I'm, I need to be baptized. I'm on my way. Kind of give me an idea how long it's going to be before you get here. That way I'm ready for you. Um, and if you're in another part of the world or another part of the state or that you can't get here, um, God has provided somebody for you. God doesn't speak the message of salvation to you without providing a way for you. He doesn't say repent and be baptized if he hasn't already prepared the way. He did it for a man named Saul in the scriptures. He prepared a way, an appointed time, and, and he's got that for you. And he's going to speak that name into your into your heart right now, into your mind. And, and as you hear that voice whisper in your head, who to go talk to because they're going to be the one that's going to baptize you. I want you to just go to them right now. You know exactly who they are. You know where they are. Go to them and say that God told me to come see you. I need to be baptized. And they'll speak the truth to you. And they're going to baptize you in the name of Jesus. It's going to be a great day for you. So praise God for that. Um, invite you guys to come worship with us. If you don't have a place to worship, come to the church Chancy Road. We're Wednesday nights at 645. Communion, Bible study, and worship. Uh, Sunday mornings, 1015, communion, Bible study, and worship. So if you like it short, come on Wednesday night. Um, start at 645, end around 815. If you like it, uh, kind of open-ended and go a long time. Um, Sunday morning, 1015 till about 1, 115. So uh, there's your choices. Um, both days have things for uh, the kids and such. So um Come and be blessed if you need food. Our food pantry is open Mondays, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Monday night, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Thursday, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. So if you need food, come. Uh, we'll be more than happy to help you with your physical needs. And that way, God's abundantly blessing. And uh, we are abundantly sharing. So uh, with all that said, y'all have a great night. And uh, God bless you. And uh, you know, choose wisely tonight.